and uh, yeah, feel free to also come towards the, the front. There are plenty of seats there. Don't be shy. Uh, okay, so I'm very happy to introduce our next speaker, uh, who is not only a member of the advisory board of ICD, uh, also the founding president of the session. Uh, Sir James Mancham has been a big support and help of ICD, in particular since the summer. Uh, we've had many conversations, many discussions about really what are the challenges ahead. Uh, and I think he and I really see eye to eye on this issue also of global citizens, uh, which is one of the main topics also of your recent book. Uh, which we actually have information on on our homepage, if anyone's interested. Uh, but this idea of a global citizen, I mean, can we really have a world without walls? Can we really live as one planet, as one globe? Uh, and I think we also see eye to eye on really the crucial need uh, for further research in the field of cultural diplomacy. Uh, as I said, really, you know, the main reason why we're doing this work at the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy is trying to make a contribution to get the dialogue going, to increase the research, increase the teaching, uh, and also the programs. So I think there I see it as, a, on the one hand, a positive potential, on the other hand, a huge challenge. Uh, we can't do it alone, uh, so we're really hoping also that we can extend also the advisory board through also this, this event, uh, these four days, also extend our network, and I'm hoping out of the 200 participants who are here, hopefully we'll have 200 partners uh, in the sense we really would love to stay connected with you and to work with you uh, with your own initiatives and also with ICD initiatives in the future. Uh, so see that as my invitation to please stay connected with us. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done and we really can't do it alone. Um, the topic of the discussion now more or less will also be this issue global citizen. Uh, Sir James uh, Mancham is going to be speaking from his personal as well as his professional experience. The topic on the agenda, uh, which is really a guide, not necessarily a limitation, uh, is national sovereignty and the developments uh, of international relations since 1989, the example of the Seychelles, uh, which is a fascinating example, not only in terms of the, the massive implications of the environment uh, and climate change now, uh, but also in terms of its political history. Uh, so I'd please ask everyone to give me a very warm welcome for Sir James Mansion. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, dear friends, today we are the 7th of November 2009, assembled here under the auspices of the Institute for Cultural Diplomacy to discuss a world without wars. Well, on the 11th of August, 1939, the day I was born, the bells of the cathedral in the small town of Victoria on the island of Mai in the Seychelles kept on ringing. For a while, my mother thought it was ringing to announce my arrival in this world. But sadly, this was not the case. It was ringing to announce the breakup of the Second World War. Today, Seventy years later, the world has still not learned the lessons of war. As I grew up, we had the war in Egypt when there was the Anglo-Israel invasion after Nasser seized the Suez Canal. Then we got the war in Korea. Korea divided into two, one leaning towards communism and the other one leaning towards democracy and freedom. <coughs> After that, we've had war in Ireland, the war in the Middle East, which never stops. We've had the war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan, the NATO invasion of Serbia, 
etc., etc. But if we are going to think about war, perhaps the most important one which characterized life in many nations for many, many years was the war we called the Cold War. Where, as we know, there were two main factions, each one trying to suggests that the devil is represented by the other side. Brought up in the British colony of Seychelles, I was educated to believe that if the Soviet Union had won the Cold War, then that the Soviet Union would start to act unilaterally arrogantly and impact the world with dictatorial rule, etc. But the Soviet Union did not win the Cold War. As we know, our friends in the United States won the Cold War. Soon after, there was a group of right-of-the-right right Americans who compiled a report styled Pax Americana, Peace the American Way. These people said that we in America, we have become militarily so powerful that we could act without having to concert other nations. We had become so strong, and therefore we should do what we want, because if other nations had been in our position, this is the way they would have acted. These people were not getting very far until the 11th of September incident took place. And thereafter, we saw a drift in the United States towards unilateralism. The United States is a very essential nation in terms of future peace. That is why we cannot avoid speaking about the future without speaking about what is going on within the United States. Yesterday, James Mr. Barber, who spoke about the isolationist attitude of President Washington when he said that he didn't want Americans to have very much to do with Europeans. This situation doesn't seem to have disappeared. We know the decision of President Bush, for example, not to sign the International Convention about the establishment of an criminal court of justice. Now I recall following the debates on this issue, and I recall listening to President Bush speaking to a, a group of Middle Eastern Americans, maybe of cowboy persuasion, and telling them, how can we ascribe to a convention which would allow Americans to be tried by people with frogs, nails, etc. This certainly indicated 
the level of leadership prevailing through democratic means in this most powerful of nation which has the capacity tomorrow to destroy the world. I have spoken and I speak a little bit more about my disenchantment with certain aspects of US foreign policy. The war in Iraq. We saw the United States going to war in Iraq after marginalizing the United Nations on the ground that Saddam Hussein was much manufacturing weapons of mass destruction. At the very same time, let's not forget, the United States found the audacity to go before its own Congress to ask for billions of dollars to develop something even more powerful called small nukes. I recall the debate on this issue when the late Senator Ted Kennedy said, will one eighth of an Hiroshima do? Will one fourth of an Hiroshima do? Will half of an Hiroshima do? If we manufacture them, we could ultimately use them. What a stark picture of the potential before us. Yes, my friend, what is the state of the world today as we sit and debate on the question of peace, enduring peace, and a better world order. As a member of the Academic Council of the European Council for Peace Development, I have had several opportunities over recent years to go to Belgrade and Kosovo to try and dry up the water where it is swimming today. But on the recent visit to Kosovo, as I drove across that sad country, I found all these military contingents. There was, I think, German, Austrian, Dutch, French, every one of them heavily loaded with big tanks, PTK-47, you name it, they had it. And that night I started to reflect how much money is being spent in peacekeeping as opposed to peacemaking. This, of course, reflected also my delusion in the fact that after the Cold War, instead of seeing a reduction in nuclear capacity, we saw an increase in the armament industry. When we think quietly, objectively, about the amount of people today in the United States who depend on their living under the defense umbrella. We bound sometimes to ask whether this not great nation has not suddenly become a vested interest in conflict. Coast Guard 
FBI, CIA research, military, Navy, Air Force gets bigger and bigger. Yet we all know that the future, the solution to the problem we face is not to be achieved, cannot be achieved through military means. Some months ago, I was on the way to Korea to attend a peace conference. And I had to transit through Paris in the early morning, catch a flight to Seoul. That morning, when I got down, where the taxi normally are, there was no taxi that there was an American gentleman with a suitcase. And the first taxi came, he was in front of me, and he was about to take the, the, the taxi when I said, Sir, if you're going to shower the gold, do you mind if I share the trip with you? He said, not at all. Please join me. And I joined him. Two minutes later, I handed in my hand, I said, I'm James. He said, I'm Jason. He said, James, where are you going early this morning? I said, to Korea. Going to Korea? What are you going to do in Korea? I said, well, I'm going to take part in a conference on peace. He said, peace? He said, don't you think you're wasting your time? There's been war, there's been problem all these years, and you think you're going to achieve peace? I said, my friend, except my understanding is that the next war could have a nuclear dimension. He said, James, you got a point. And we carried on. Two minutes later, I said, James, I hope you don't mind. I would like to I would talk to my boss in Washington. So he took his mobile in front of me and he spoke. And he was reporting his success in Paris selling military leases to hosts of third world nations. So there you see that sort of scenario we face in the world today. There's one man from some islands down there, heading for Korea to try and speak about peace. And another one certainly having a real vested interest in war. The tasks before us are great. There is indeed a need to put aside traditional diplomacy with its military dimension in the interest of cultivating a new sort of diplomacy as envisaged in the objective of the Institute of Cultural Diplomacy. But in order for us to achieve this, we must start to think about creating global statesmen. We must start to get away from this area which we know as politicians. The politician is interested in power. The politician is interested in the next election. We need statesmen who would be interested in future generation. Against the background of this conviction, in my book about which Chairman Mark 
non fried as referred. I have a few lines for President Barack Obama. President Barack Obama has a unique opportunity to go down in the world as a great statesman. But in order for him to be able to do so, he would have to put the interest of the world first. The interest of the USA second, and the interest of the Democratic Party third. And he must not be mindful as to whether he's going to be re-elected again tomorrow. The day he starts to play bipartisan politics in the way bipartisan politics is now being played in the USA, he is going to be caught up in the same cross-current of vicious bipartisan propaganda which we have seen characterized politics in what we would have regarded as the most matured democracy in the world. I believe we must find a lot of statesmen also emerging from the United States in order to try and bridge the gap behind the actual partisan divide. Because we need the United States to be strong and united especially as we see on the horizon the growth of other powers like India, like China. But in order to succeed with our philosophy of cultural diplomacy, we must come to term with certain honest realities. For too long now, we've been living in a world of the mighty dollar, where people have measured success in relation to the amount of money one has been able to accumulate. But I dare say that you can have your bed made of gold, and I can have mine made of wood, but if when I get to on my wooden bed, I sleep peacefully, I am having a higher level of quality of life than you are, and therefore I'm a richer man. We cannot, my friends, get away from this truth, the reality. It is not going to be very easy for those of us who've acquired so much to realize that a bit of sharing, a bit of caring here and there would very much contribute towards a better world. We speak a lot about energy today, about sun energy, wind energy, solar energy, whatever. But there's an energy also which we must stop. And that's an energy I find there's a lot around in this world today. Human energy. This institute is a young institute. But its life should be and must be far, far, far longer than we can think. Because the task which we've set ourselves to do is not going to be easy. It's going to be most challenging. It's going to be difficult. But unless we start, we're not going to get anywhere. That's where I command all of you who are here today because you support the core principles of the Institute. Make no mistake that things are not going to be easy, but 
with the amount of energy which we have, there's nothing which we cannot change. So let us all work together, fully committed, to do our best because the world is in a messy situation and I am sure that many of you may have certain questions for me, more or less focus on this beautiful country I come from, Seychelles. For this matter, I'll give my time, myself some time to answer some questions rather than keep going along the line of global politics. Thank you. very much, uh, Sir Manchin, uh, for the very thought-provoking presentation, and I appreciate the fact that we now do have some time for interactive dialogue and questions. I will give the microphone to my colleague, Matisse, if you could please just raise your hand, uh, who would like to ask the first question? Thank you. Um, Mr. President, I'd like to ask you a few, your opinion on the upcoming Copenhagen summit. Um, the um, talks in Barcelona, which were supposed to prepare the summit, um, have more or less, well, have not really led to clear results. Um, and you coming from a country that is um, directly threatened by climate change, what would your ideal solution be and what you think will actually happen? Thank you. Well, I think we put a lot of faith in this Copenhagen gathering. I also happen to be a member of the Board of, Adv of Advisors of World Future Council, which is headquartered in Hamburg, Germany. And for months now we've been working on different presentations to make in Copenhagen. We did not expect to see agreement in the way we anticipated it to be needed, taking into account prevailing conditions. Yes, this global warming question is of great concern. In Seychelles, we are not perhaps as affected as some other island nations because half of our islands are granitic, which means they rise to several thousand feet. They build on solid rocks and granite soil, and uh, therefore they are not as menaced as the other group of our islands, which are of coral formation, like the Maldives, Bahamas, etc. And um, certainly, we are very, very concerned, but the reality is that economically we are bankrupt. So like most of the nations, we belong to the school of thought that those who are responsible to create the situation by over-industrialization, etc., should come to our help. But we live at their mercy. Any other question? Can I ask about the, uh, the role of small countries? Uh, uh, hello, hello? Yes. Right and uh, my point really is that in the old uh, world order, pre-89, there were two major power blocks and then there was a non-aligned movement. Uh, but in the new world order, increasingly it looks as if a small number of very large countries uh, will drive international discussions and perhaps some groups like the European Union groups of nations that have some history together now uh, may be able to, to work with them. But increasingly, small countries 
might struggle to find a voice or an influence. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on how the small nations of the world, of which the Seychelles is one of the smallest, obviously, um, but the small nations of the world can find a voice and an influence in the 21st century world order, which will be dominated by Russia, America, China, India, Brazil, and others. Thank you very much. It's a very interesting question, very interesting comments. I would like to share with you what I said in New York some months ago after I was introduced by a chairman of a group at a discussion saying that pleasure to introduce Mr. Mankham from a small country known as the Seychelles. Now when I stood up to speak, I said, Mr. Chairman, there is one point I beg to disagree with you. That is, no country is small if it is surrounded by the sea. Now, let's analyze this. We are 110 small islands spread over a very wide surface of the Indian Ocean. At the end of the Falkland Island War, Admiral X, head of the Institute of Strategic Studies in Washington, D.C., wrote a report about the importance of small islands, saying that islands like those in the Seychelles, situated in the midst of the most important oil trading route in the world, all as the potential of being considered as unsinkable aircraft carriers. Because each one of them can be utilized as a launching pad. And it is, in fact, the reason that as to why the United States today has next to Seychelles the most sophisticated military naval complex outside the United States on the island of Diego Garcia. Now in terms of voice, this is also something which I would like to talk about because there are a lot of representatives from countries which uh, relatively are small compared to the giants. Let me say that in the global village of today, we must assert that the fact that we come from small nation doesn't mean we are small people. Today we live in the world of mass media. You may come from Russia, you may come from the United States, but if you appear on the television speaking nonsense, people will find out this man is speaking nonsense. And you may come from the smallest country too, but you speaking sense, people also will see. He is telling the truth. So I don't think we should deter ourselves in terms of contributing towards a better world order by saying that the people in the bigger nations have got a better right to speak than we have. So let's all of us have a voice in the future of the global village. So we have time for a few more questions. Uh, actually, Matisse, you have one. Uh, maybe if you could, Matisse, go over to that side, and then we'll, uh, I'll stay on this side. We can take maybe uh, in the front here. There are a few. And then I see also in the back. Here. Uh, Mr. President, I thank you very much for your directness in pointing out the audacity of my country. <laughs> There was a film out a few years ago, which perhaps some people here have seen, called Why We Fight. And in the beginning of that film, there was a warning by President Eisenhower, which seems to have been filed away in the United States and not taken out for public discussion. He warned about the growth of this military industrial complex called the United States. I only have a comment about something that I read this morning over at the Kaiser Wilhelm Church. 
which I think is quite appropriate. I'd just like to make that statement here. I, I wrote it down. In the Kaiser Wilhelm Church, you were asked to remember that the, the, this vestibule is not a museum, but a place of remembrance, contemplation, and exhortation. You see these pictures, and they are a challenge to us all to constantly resist the solution of political problems by means of war. They call us to reconciliation and understanding, the basis of peaceful relationships between peoples and nations. And I implore this next generation that is here today to please heed those words. Thank you. I would like to say how much I welcome your intervention. And you may be glad to hear that in the book which I've recently published, Thesher Global Citizen, I have utilized a quote from former President Dwight Eisenhower, which focused immediately and exactly along the lines of what you are telling us. Yes, President Eisenhower said, that the way we have developed militarily, let no one believe that anybody is going to be a victor tomorrow. And he said words to the effect that finally, let this fact alone compel us to sit down on the table of dialogue. Words to that effect. I fully share your standpoint, I'm glad that you providing the encouragement for us to go along the line of realizing the futility of trying to think we can dominate any part of the world by military means. We have a fact in Seychelles which is showing this very clearly. We've got the biggest navy now patrolling the Indian Ocean, yet a group of bandits calling themselves pirates from Somalia is playing hide and seek. Every day they're capturing some people in our ocean. Big warships are there, and they've realized the limitation. You can have all the biggest warship, but how do you deal with a failed state and people who have decided that they're not going to play along the line of any civilized behavior? Time for two more questions. Let's say one in the front and then one way in the back, just to make sure we have both sides. Yeah. There's a question of my mind that uh, I'm a little hesitating to ask because I don't want to, this to come across as disrespectful. I would like to pick up on a subject that the gentleman from Scotland raised and approach it from the very different, very opposite uh, part, and that is size of countries, for example, in the United Nations. There's a lot of talk about making uh, the United Nations uh, more equitable by reflecting. Uh, changes in the world order. Germany, my country, is among the countries obviously that's aspiring to playing a more important role also in the Security Council. My question to you would be, uh, could you imagine that in the course of making uh, the United Nations more representative of today's world, uh, something very opposite could also happen to countries like your country, and that is that there be a weighted uh, vote that would sort of cut the one country, one vote principle down to sort of relative size. And one of the reasons why I'm wondering about this is that there seems to be a sad practice that smaller countries are simply more vulnerable for the buying off of their votes, for example, as non-permanent members uh, on the Security Council. Again, not meant to be disrespectful, but just reflecting reality. Uh, the, there are two dimensions <coughs> to your question. Is it tendency when you speak like Germany, to look at small island nation and say we are big, they are small. But if you look up, you've got China. How many votes are you going to give to China? How many votes are you going to give, give to India? Then China, India, Indonesia will rule the United Nations. So it's not a question which has an easy answer. A lot of thoughts must go into this.
you spoke a bit about creating global statesmen. And as a student of public administration, um, I completely agree with you. And I'm wondering what suggestions you would have for universities and law schools and public policy schools that could help create a new generation of politicians and policymakers that have a more global perspective and goal rather than something that is just merely domestic? Well, we must educate the world and our people about the importance of statesmanship. There is no nation in modern history which has projected so many examples of statesmanship over recent years than this country, Germany. After the end of the Second World War, it prevailed between France and Germany. It took two statesmen, General Charles de Gaulle and Conrad Adenauer, to rise above the level of partisan politics, of the politics of division, and to create that unity of friendship which has been the base of Europe. You go to France today or to Germany, nobody is hating anyone. That's a great sign of what statesmanship brought about. And then think about this phenomena of German reunification. To me, it's a reflection of the maturity of the German people, irrespective of what other negative aspect we may wish to ascribe to them. Matured people able to bring together the communists of the East with the free enterprise people of the West in this situation today where the leading politician came from the East. So certain things are achievable and statesmanship, I believe, must be underlined as being most important. We must think first about the future of the world. Mahatma Gandhi said, there is enough in this world for everybody's need, but there is not enough in this world for everybody's greed. Maybe we should talk a little bit about this too. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, I think we do need to bring this to a close now in respect for the other sessions, but maybe once again a big thank you for Sir James Manchin. Thank you.